Hello, my name is Mark Williamson and a very, very warm welcome to all of you joining us from all around the world for this very special live Action for Happiness event. Uh, it's fantastic to see so many of you joining us and welcoming each other from all around the world. And I'm particularly delighted that we're joined today by Dr. Vandana Shiva. And uh, welcome to you, Vandana, and particularly delighted because today is International Women's Day. And I couldn't think of a more inspiring and uh, amazing, in, you know, incredible woman to have with us to share this time together today. So Vandana, thank you for um, being with us. Thank you, Mark. My video has to be enabled at your end. Ah, well, I look forward to seeing you hopefully okay. momentarily. Now, well. now they've just started. There we go. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Happy Women's Day to everyone. Indeed. Well, today's theme is ecological happiness. And of course, uh, Dr. Shiva, you've got such an, a wealth of experience in relation to ecology, uh, but also, I think, with what we care so much about with Action for Happiness, the, the idea of how to create a world where people can really thrive. And what I'm looking forward to exploring with you uh, at today's event is this idea of the connection between our own happiness and the happiness of our wonderful planet that we're all living on. Um, a, a very warm welcome to anyone who's joining us for the first time today. Just say a few moments about this. So Vandana and I will have a conversation for about half an hour. There'll be some interactive things for you to get involved in wherever you are in the world. And there'll be a chance for a Q&A where you can ask your own questions to Vandana a bit later on. Thank you for being part of the chat and please do use the Q&A and let's keep all of the conversation kind, supportive and relevant as I know you always do. Um, Vandana, maybe we could start though, uh, I know many people will be very familiar with your amazing work, but perhaps you could say a little bit about your personal journey and why this topic is so important to you. Well, my, my personal journey began in the forests of the Himalaya. But from there, you know, because of the, uh, the sculpturing of uh, Einstein, I've done myself because he's been the inspiration for me to, to you know, find a, a path in physics. And I did a PhD in hidden variables and non-locality in quantum theory, which actually teaches you exactly the same thing that ecology teaches you. Uh, but before leaving for Canada, where I did my PhD, I went to visit a favorite forest and the forest was gone and streams coming from it were a trickle. And that's when I heard of this movement called Chipko where women came out to embrace the trees and said, you can't destroy these trees because these trees are our life. And from that time onwards, you know, um, I've responded to, to disasters, the pain of nature, the pain of people, the Bhopal disaster, the uprisings in Punjab, so I looked at the Green Revolution. And then because of my studies on the Green Revolution, I got invited to biotech meetings where they said, oh, now we want to own the seed. I said, but you don't create the seed. Seed is not a machine, it's not an invention. So I started to save seeds and the movement of Dania uh, grew out of that. 1987, I started my journey of saving seeds. Um, realized how important biodiversity was and um, have, you know, both the scientific understanding of biodiversity, as well as the conservation, our beautiful farm, where we've just had a celebration of diverse women for diversity. Uh, every one of them left saying, it's been such joy, not only because people were together, but because the farm is a biodiversity farm where diversity thrives, different crops are working together, the pollinators are pollinating, the earthworms, uh, fertilizing and um, and we're growing right now 250 varieties of wheat next season we'll grow 750 varieties of rice but across the country we save 4,000 varieties of rice wow in 150 community seed banks that we have started so I, I feel very grateful that I've been I've dedicated my life to nature first in study through physics but then through activism, and I've done it for 50 years now. It's amazing, and what a fantastic combination of the science, the, the practice, and uh, the sort of wisdom that you, you can bring. And I, I love the joy that you shared there in that, in that example, because I think that brings us to this topic of happiness. And many of us that care deeply about um, 
you know, people's well-being in the broadest sense, I guess have a sense that we somehow have become a bit separate from the earth. We see our our own well-being as perhaps dependent on ourselves and each other, but actually we, in many ways, especially in the modern Western world, we, we, we seem to be increasingly disconnected from the natural world. So I wanted to start with a quite a big question, and I know it's something you could talk deeply on, but what do you see as the connection between our happiness and the happiness of our natural ecosystem and our world? Well, the connection is that we are part of nature. We are not separate. The illusion of separation was constructed very deliberately. The rise of colonialism, the rise of industrialism. It wasn't by accident that Mr. Bacon, the Chancellor of England, created a science which he called the masculine birth of time. That till then, the relationship with nature as a living relationship was an effeminate relationship. And now domination, mastery, subjugation of nature, torturing her, enslaving her, that was going to be the future of science in the hands of a few supermen. And if today you hear the word science with a capital S to shut down diversity of knowledge, well, that's what's going on. Um, the witch hunts continue. And even the witch hunts were a silencing of knowledge as part of nature because nine million people were killed in Europe. Most of them women. Which women? Women healers, women elders, women who knew how to live as part of nature and guide people in that wisdom. So the separation was very violently imposed. And uh, indigenous people, even today, don't even look at the world that way. Yeah? They look at Pachamama in the Andes. Uh, in India, we call her Vasundhara. Um, we call the earth family, Vasudheva Kutumbakam. You're going to hear a lot of it because it's been picked up as the slogan for the G20 this year, but mm. it, it's very much more in a political sense than an ecological sense. Vasundra is the name of the earth, Vasudheva Kutumbakam is the name of her family, and all beings are our relatives. So just like in a family, when there's friction and conflict and unhappiness, even one member of the family, the whole family is unhappy. So if we create unhappiness for other beings, we will be unhappy. But more importantly than that, you know, the natural world is not something out there. It is not an object outside us. Nature, earth, life, we use different words. Nature was the word that was picked up for objectification because it's more difficult to objectify the earth, even though a jurisprudence was created to transform terra madre the living Mother Earth into terra nullius, the empty land, just raw material, empty of rights, empty of knowledge, empty of care. And, and what's, you know, ordinary people know, they breathe. And when the air is polluted, you know, that air is all, you know, it's, the air has been harmed, but we are harmed. Look at the number of respiratory diseases, result of pollution of air. Mm. We, and you know, in, when we do yoga and you all meditate, uh, uh, pranayam, the deep breathing, breathing in and breathing out, the mantra that said is so hum, you are therefore I am. Mm. Where is our breath coming from? The photosynthesis of the green leaves. They're giving us food. They're taking out the carbon dioxide and they're giving us oxygen as a gift. And when we destroy, and when the women of Chipko said you cannot destroy these forests, they give us soil and water and oxygen. They, they said breath. Village women who'd never been to school were teaching the highest classes of ecological relationship. Or take water. When we destroy water systems, there is no water, or we get waterborne diseases. By billion people are going to be suffering for lack of water because we've abused it. We've destroyed it with pollution, extraction, mining, everywhere, and producing food in ways that is wasting water and polluting water. But food itself, you know, in, in our philosophy, and I mean, you know, as a scientist, I know a fundamental cycle, two fundamental cycles are ecological cycles, the water cycle and the nutrition cycle. 
The nutritional cycle is the cycle of food. So what connects us to the world is food as the currency of life, as the dialogue between different beings. It is not a stuff to be stuffed in. It is not a commodity. It's not a thing. Food is life. In fact, we say Annam Brahman. When you eat real food, it's creating your health. So the illusion that we are separate from nature is at the root of the, all the ecological disasters we face. But it is also at the root of the violence against indigenous people. You know, when Boyle, who also been you know, in the Boyle's equation, but he was the governor of the Church of England. He was the first director of the Royal Society to implement Mr. Bacon's masculine philosophy. And he said, I mean, he was a Church of England. And he said the church should destroy the idea of a sacred nature and let native people think that it's just mechanical raw material. And they are primitive because they think they're part of nature and they must be civilized to think of a dead nature. So oh, that's no, no, no. how it, we separated ourselves. Yeah. But every time we breathe, every time we drink water, every time we eat, if every time that act is a meditation on our relationship with the earth, of course well, we will act in the right ways. Yes, well said. Th thank you for that context. And I think in, in summary, you're reminding us that there is no human health and happiness without health and happiness of the planet. And I'd love to take a pause because you, you also shared so many reasons for us to feel gratitude towards this amazing sort of ecosystem that we all rely on. I, I wanted to turn to our lovely community who are always very engaged here and just invite each of you listening wherever you are around this beautiful planet right now. What's one thing that you feel grateful for to our natural world? And maybe if you'd like to share a few words in the chat, Vandana, I, I can read out some of these and we can reflect on them together. So what do you really appreciate about nature? So I'll read some of these out. Sunlight, the wind, beauty, peace, birdsong, water, life, trees, sunsets, rain, animals, the sea, snow, flowers and trees, the smells, the colors, the silence, the tranquility, diversity, mountains, life, seasons, dogs, uh, sunrise, woods, nature, grass under my feet, bees, spirits, life, nature, skies, and the list goes on and on. How, how are you feeling as you hear those words, Vandana? Well, I, I, my mind is uh, looking at all the diversity and richness of life. Um, because, you know, the natural world, as I said earlier, is not a static piece of material. Nature is life. It's all gifts of the earth. And receiving the gifts, gratitude has to be our relationship. So, obviously, there are different dimensions in this topic uh, around the connection between our well-being and the, and the planetary well-being. And a bit later on, I want to come on to the idea of being a social activist because you've been an inspiration to so many of us with the way that you, you know, you're a force for good to try and change things. And I think in our own way, we can all make things better. But I think before we get into the change in the world, I think there's something about changing ourselves that also helps. And so I wanted to explore this idea of our relationship individually to the natural world and I think I would say personally it's something that I have at many times in my life taken for granted and actually your work and others have helped me really reconnect and I now love to be out in nature and I, and I think the evidence now shows that when we spend time in nature it actually really nurtures our own mental well-being we're more likely to make calm wise decisions to care more for the people and uh, other living beings around us and um, I wondered if you had any personal practices or insight around, you know, our individual relationship with the natural world? Well, you know, my life is both intellectually and in terms of practice, a daily practice of consciousness, awareness of both the living systems as well as their laws, their processes, their creativity. Um, and yes, when we go into a forest, there's enough research that shows that mental, you know, people with mental problems feel calm, but there's so much research that shows that when people with mental problems or people who are violent start to become one with the earth when they garden, they are calmed. I have seen, you know, I started a movement called Gardens of Hope because in 
you know, in the 2000s, 1998 onwards, the GMO BT cotton was brought into India illegally. I won't give you the big story about that. High costs, high failure, farmers got trapped in debt and farmers committed, started to commit suicide. We've lost 400,000 farmers to suicide since 1995 when these systems were changed. The, you know, farmers having their own seed, caring for their seed, sharing their seeds. And the big giants, you know, the four corporations that control all the seed of the world that's commercially sold. That's the reason I started to save seed. The, the suicides of farmers left widows. But the farmer committed suicide because they'd lost their land because the, the agents of the seed and chemical company said, now your land is ours because you haven't paid the debt. And so here were not just women without their husbands, they were women who were now landless. And uh, so, you know, I'm sitting with them, one of them in a hut and said, but you've got a little piece of land around your hut and let's start a garden of hope. And I said it only because I said, you know, her crying would stop and she'd have some food to give her children. And this movement has spread so big during COVID. Not only did the women who had started gardens provide their villages with food, many of them are now growing seeds to distribute to others. They've started organic vegetable businesses in their local villages and their children are getting food. And the women have realized there's an economy of working with nature because just as science was distorted, science means to know. When you torture nature, you are making sure you don't know because you're killing what you know, yeah? Violence is not the way to know. But in the same way, economy, which means it's derived from oikos, the earth, our place on the earth, management of, of our household. Oikos means our household, uh, both the bigger household of the earth, but also the local households. And as Aristotle said, oikonomia is the art of living. And the art of living is what we've forgotten because we've been at war with the earth. You know, the economic models are telling us competition is the way, the science models telling us we are separate from nature and nature is inert and nature is dead. All of this has declared war against the earth, but that has bounced on us. Look at climate change. What is it a result of? That we ignore the life-giving energies of biodiverse biosystems spheric systems, which have regulated the climate of this planet. Can you imagine? Over 4 billion years, this earth, which was, which was initially not fertile and abundant, through the microbes and the plants, the photosynthesis brought life on this planet, brought us, you know, 200 years ago, 200,000 years ago, Reduce the temperatures from 290 degrees to 13 degrees. Reduce the carbon dioxide to 98, from 98% to 0.03%. But we are not even looking at the earth as our teacher on how to address climate change. That's the work I do. That's why I wrote the book, Soil Not Oil. But in Navdanya, what we do is grow biodiversity to perform all the functions, not just of addressing climate change, but also regenerating biodiversity because biodiversity mm. loss is such a big problem. 93% biodiversity gone because of industrial mm. farming. 50% emissions come from industrial agriculture and globalized systems of food, which are also making us sick. And, and think of that. The same system that's making the earth sick is making us sick. 75% of the chronic diseases that we suffer. And show me a person who's a happy person with sickness. If you've got an irritable gut syndrome and you're running to the loo all the time or children have a leaky gut, that's not a happy place to be. Or if you have diabetes and you get complications, you have to be amputated. Not a happy place to be. Or toxics have given you cancer. Glyphosate have induced cancer. That's not happiness. No, you're, so, right. you're right. And sorry, I was. I, was I just want to complete that, please, Mark. Please. The, the sorry, key yeah. issue is the biodiversity in the soil, the biodiversity of the plants, and the biodiversity in our gut microbiome is one continuum of well being and health. We have a hundred trillion fellow beings 
in our gut. I call it the forest within. It's nature within. When we deforest it and desertify it with monocultures and chemicals, that's where sickness begins. And now in the last 10 years, all of science is starting to recognize the link between the soil and the gut. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I, I had a huge transformation when I started to nurture my own microbiome to use the terminology and, I, and to, to open up my eyes to a whole new inner world. Um, but I, I also love what you said about the gardens of hope, Vandana, because many of those things you've mentioned are a source of great fear, for, I'm sure for you, but for many of us about the, the state of the world and, and the climate and the biodiversity. And it's difficult to stay hopeful. We had a wonderful event with uh, Dr. Chris Johnson recently about active hope um, and how we can cultivate that. And in a moment, I'd love to come on to the idea of us as, us as activists for change. But just on this spirit of hope, I wonder, let's imagine, I, I would imagine there are some people with us in this community today who don't have your level of connection to the natural world, perhaps feel a bit disconnected. What would be your advice to all of us really about how we can, as individuals, do, do more to, to feel connected to, to nurture, to care about this wonderful uh, ecosystem all around us? What would be your advice? I never give advice. I think it's a bad, arrogant place to be. You know, how do I know more than you know? Um, but I can share what I've learned in my life. The first is hopelessness is not a luxury we can afford. Just because, not only because it blocks us from feeling uh, feeling fully human, having full potential, it blocks us from action. And, you know, because of, of the way climate message has been handled, so many people have climate trauma. I know they call me for talks and they talk about climate trauma. And I go through the science of climate change. And I said, there's every place in that broken system where you can play a role. And of course, my quantum training has been a big blessing. My ecological training is what allows me to cultivate hope on a daily basis. But my quantum training has given me the worldview that there's uncertainty, therefore there's no inevitability of predictability of collapse. Just that gives hope. Uncertainty mm. is a basis of hope. So use the openings of uncertainty to play your little role, plant your little seed, grow your little garden, create your little community, and then other things grow from there. I just started to save seeds. I didn't realize we'd be protecting bias, the biosphere. We'd be bringing back the pollinators six times more than in the forest next door. Soil organisms, 3,600% more fungi, just by gratitude and giving back to the earth and loving the earth. So, Care for the earth. You don't have to have every detailed knowledge of the soil food web. No. Soil is living. Love the soil. Work in the soil. Plants are living. Say thank you to them just every day. And, and the more you do it, the more the soil will teach you and the plants will teach you and the bees will teach you. I love that. Thank you. That's so inspiring. Um, Vandana, it feels to me that we should also talk about community because, um, well, in Action for Happiness, we have this uh, aim to create a happier and kinder world together. And that together world is really important because we're all part of one big human family and of course, one big family of living beings on this wonderful planet. And I, I think that the modern world in particular is isolating us, it's leaving us feeling as individuals and losing that sense of connection. How do you see that link between our, our connectedness and this natural world? And maybe how can we harness that power of community and togetherness to yeah. help make some of these changes happen? I think the very natural way to appreciate connectedness is to give up the mechanistic thinking. Because when we think mechanically, we think of food as something we pick up from a supermarket shelf. We forgot, forget its link to the soil that grew it, the seed that gave, gave the plant that we eat. So the mechanistic philosophy and mechanistic thinking 
reduces everything to stuff and to objects. But life is about flows. The flows of water through the system, the flows of food and nutrition through the system, the flows of love and compassion through life and through community. And I want to share with you, you know, on His Holiness's 60th birth anniversary, there's a big conference in Delhi and they'd asked me to come and give a talk um, for him. And, you know, of course, that's the peak of, that was 1995, you know, peak of my involvement with the question of seed and GMOs and patents on life and patents on seed. So that's what I talked about. And this is what he wrote, and I show it to you. He scribbled it for me. This is the Dalai Lama, yeah? Dalai Lama, his audience is the Dalai Lama. He writes, this is my talk on GMOs and patents. This is a holiness's response. All sentient beings, including the small insects, cherish themselves. All have the right to overcome suffering and achieve happiness. I therefore pray that we show love and compassion to all. That's beautiful. Um, thank you for sharing that. I, I feel a real connection to that because of your work, but also because we're very honored to have His Holiness as the patron of our Action for Happiness community and have done various events with him as well. Vandana, I'd love to come from there to this idea of each of us being sort of agents for change. Here we are on International Women's Day. You've done so much to inspire and influence others. We may not have your reach or your experience, but I believe that we can each be a ripple for change wherever we are in the world in our own small ways, are planting our own seeds of hope, to use your metaphor. But uh, could you tell us a bit about how to be effective social activists? How can we help create a world that is more connected to the natural world, connected to each other, more humane, more caring, um, less mechanistic and less individualistic, if you like? Well, I think each of us eat. And we can begin by conscious eating. We can begin by shedding this very artificial identity we've been given to be passive consumers of a society, of an economy that's devastating the earth and forcing us to participate in that destruction. The word consumer, consumption, you know what origins are? People died of consumption. Of, it's the name for TB in the Middle Ages. And in a way, we are making the planet die and our own systems die by consumption as consumerism. So, uh, you know, just think every time. You have to get something. Do I really need it? You know? R reduce your pressure on the planet by reducing your, you know, I learned simplicity from my parents. And they were amazing. They gave us the best legacy. But so, it's so simply, my father, I saw him in one suit throughout his life, senior forest officer. Before that, a senior major in the British Army. My mother, two saris. And they would tell us, well, if we, you know, dressed up, where would you be send you to school and the best of us of schools? So simplicity for me is revolutionary. I think Satish Kumar has written a lovely book called Elegant Simplicity. And he was with me in the World Economic Forum and they said, oh, but, you know, if people want colored TV, people want cars, people want fridges. And he replied and said, yeah, but they don't get happier, happier with all that consumption. You know, in, in fact, they get into debt. They get miserable because someone else has a, the latest model of the car. I have watched India, you know, create multiple unhappinesses chasing the car. We want an automobile society and we've been made. And every year the models change, every year you have to change it. Second, remember every time when you eat that you're eating the soil, you're eating the gifts of the earthworm, you, you're eating the gift of the bee without which your, the seed wouldn't have become the food you're eating. Um, Every time you feel, you, you start to feel isolated and lonely, go out and reach out to someone and overcome their loneliness. And through that, your loneliness will go form community. And as I said earlier, there is nothing 
like growing a garden. It doesn't matter how small. It could be your windowsill. It could be just two pots on your windowsill. But the discipline of care and identity with the soil and the plant is the cultivation of happiness and hope. Mm. Thank you. That's so wise. And I'm I'm, I'm really, uh, it warms my heart to hear you mention Satish Kumar, who's a, another friend of ours. And I believe it was Satish who actually connected the two of us as well. So very great. Yes, he, for he his, introduced his, us. His yes. Won wonderful work. Um, wow. We've, we've got um, some lovely questions coming up in the, the Q&A already. So if you're uh, listening into this and you'd like to ask Vandana a question, please do use the Q&A. And you can also vote on each other's questions and, and that will help them rise up the list. But before we, we uh, move to that, I just wanted to do two other things. Well, one is just to reflect on what you've said, Vandana, about simplicity. So I believe there was often ways that, that can both help reconnect us with the natural world and also be a force for good at the same time. And you've given many examples. My personal one is cycling. I'm a keen cyclist. I love being out in nature on my bike. And also that means I don't drive and I don't you know, use sort of more polluting forms of transport um so it, it helps me and i hope in it in my own small way it helps the natural world so i i love your encouragement for all of us to see the that aspect of what we're doing but the other thing i'd like to do on that note is to encourage just to turn back to this lovely community we have with us today and ask if you would um if, if anyone wanted to share something that they would like to take away from this conversation today as an action that, that their own little seed if you like so what's your little action your life you're going to take to help nurture and feel more connected to the natural world let's just see a few of these in the chat and then we'll come to a question so please share your own ideas for reconnecting with nature for making a difference so let me see i'm going to grow uh, my own garden of hope eat more mindfully have my allotment choose an area in my garden to be more hopeful connect to my community, not buy food from far away, think before buying, plant more trees, have a discipline of care, show gratitude to nature, have a plant-based lifestyle, forest braving, loving my plants, riding my bike, eating salads, uh, picking up litter, being more aware of seasonal eating, getting into nature more often, planting more seeds, encouraging simplicity in everything, that's just some of the things that are flying up on my screen, Vandana. That, that sounds to me like a, a lovely set of actions. How are you feeling about those? Yeah, very inspiring. Great. Um, let's come to some questions. So, but Mark, may I, may I just please. say one thing? Yeah, of course. Don't say I get onto my, my bike and go to nature. You are in nature, sitting at home, sitting there. You, you know, if you're alive, you're alive because nature's giving you life. Thank you. That's very, very true. And also another reminder of how much I take for granted and perhaps many of us do. So thank you. I, I, I completely agree. And that was misspoken. But actually, that's I'm really glad that came up because that's a really important point. Um, to the question then. So Stuart has said, Dr. Shiva, what do you think it will take to encourage Western governments to make the shift away from cozy relationships with environmentally damaging corporations to embrace a more ecologically sensitive approach to policies and society? Big question. You Very know, important. I've been through so many stages. I've been through in the pre-globalization days where actions like Chipko changed policy. You know, we shifted the idea that forests are timber mines to recognition that forests are the source of soil and water and, and they became called conservation forests. And then I've been through the period of globalization and we organized as the International Forum on Globalization. I've also witnessed how, how big money, you know, I have a book called Oneness Versus One Percent, which, you know, which is I'm un trying to understand what, what's going on. How are the billionaires ruling the world? Because they are, they are telling our governments, now you do this, now you do this. So I don't think the car, the, you know, the, the, in any dynamic system, there's always a place where openings can happen. Yeah. And there are other places where there's closure. At this point of history, in this particular phase, governments, of, most of them have closed themselves. I mean, the Mexican government has said we won't take GMOs because we are the country of corn. We've got to protect our heritage and our health. 
and they're being bullied on a daily basis. So as women of the world who gathered at Nathaniel, you know, letters have been sent to leaders of the world that A, we don't want GMO food and definitely governments that stand by their citizens need to be supported and governments that bully other governments and bully other citizens really are not behaving very democratically. So I think at this point, change will come by communities growing in their awareness and their practices. And the awareness and practice will become increasingly more necessary, not just for reasons that we have an obligation to the earth, but they will become more necessary for survival itself. The cost of living crisis, big issue. What's the solution? If we leave it to the big agribusiness and the big supermarkets, people are going to starve. That's why the garden of hope, that in, in one context is hope, in another context is your food security and food sovereignty. And we will have to start creating new ways to do community kitchens, to do community. Already I know about 80% of the food system is not running through government, it's running through people's community efforts, getting food to the hungry. Um, but the other really big issue is a massive, you know, just like at the time of industrialism and colonialism, nature was defined as dead inert matter, just raw material for industry. You know, the word res resource used to mean that which resurges on its own, renews on its own. And then it became that which is raw material for industry. So everyone is nervous about the use of the word resource, but its original meaning was beautiful. Right now, they're trying very hard to define nature as a financial asset to be gambled on, on Wall Street. And they're looking at $4,000 trillion for the billionaires, the stock markets, the, rock for, uh, the Black Rocks and the vanguards. And that's why love for nature, unconditional love for nature, care for nature, protection of nature as the very basis of our life is something we have to do because the other way, the future is very, very dark. You know, a million species are threatened, 200 go extinct every day. But humans too are part of the threatened species. And we need to defend the infrastructure of life rather than participate in this infrastructure of destruction of life. And for that, every day is a day of increasing our consciousness and relationship but every day finding our little place, yeah? Uh, and let me just spend a sentence on this because we've, you know, we've celebrated bigness so much, you know? Industrialism was about bigness. Colonialism was about bigness. It's always about, you know, how big a corporation is, how big a superpower is. And Gandhi dealt with the empire of cotton, the British empire by pulling out a spinning wheel. And that's where I got my inspiration to save the seeds. I said, seeds are the spinning wheel of today. And when he was laughed at, said, how can you deal with an empire with a spinning wheel? And this is what he said. It's precisely because it's so small and it can be made by anyone that the last woman, the poorest woman, woman in the smallest hut will be part of our freedom movement. And when we start making our own cloth, that's when we'll be free because we won't depend on the empire. And every... You know, for everything you live, you know, the water you drink. Don't buy Kinley, don't buy Coca-Cola. I have worked with women who shut down Coca-Cola plants because Coca-Cola bottles stolen in water. So no matter what life is about, there's a place in your smallness to do the big things that make a difference. Mm. Because the, as I said, my work is on non-locality and therefore small actions impact the big. You don't have to be big to impact the big. You can be small in the right way with the right action. That's what dharma is. The right action, the right livelihood. And we're hearing from you here on International Women's Day, lots of little micro examples of women changing the world. And of course, you yourself have been such a, an inspiration. It strikes me that part of the response to that previous question might be, we have quite a lot of men in positions of power that do quite a lot of destructive things and quite a lot of the female leaders that we have been lucky enough to have have been again this is in risk of generalizing but have been more likely to care for and respect the natural world and i wonder if 
the increasing influence of female leaders can help um, continue to put us on a, on, a better, on a better path. And that sort of links into a question here from Karen in Dublin in Ireland. She says, first of all, she would happily listen to you, this wonderful human for hours, which is nice to hear. Um, she said, Dr. Shiva, what are the most important actions each of us as individuals can do today and going forward to move towards a sort of healthier, happier, cleaner environment, towards an, a more positive nature, natural world? You know, as I I'm, I'm mentioned, you know, um, uh, food and agriculture wasn't my chosen field. I've had to respond to it because of disaster after disaster after disaster, and then study and then action. Um, if 50% of greenhouse gases come from an industrial food system and you care about climate change, then you have to get out of that industrial food system. If 75% of the disappearance of water, there's a desertification of soil, comes from the system, you care about water, give up industrial food. If you care about your health and you want your well-being looked after, then you have to start eating healthy food. It's not a luxury. Health is not a luxury. Especially when you look at, you know, you save money on cheap food and then you pay a fat bill to a doctor for all kinds of sicknesses. So I always say, you know, start treating the earth and the soil and the plants and the bees and the farmer as your physician. They are bringing you health. So, uh, you know, I think that's a place where everyone can participate mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And unlike, you know, unlike saving the whales, where a few people can be passionate about it. Eating for your health and the health of the planet is the same action of conscious eating. It's, for it's something everyone yeah. can and should do. And it's... even more important today, because fake food is the future, just like chemical agriculture was the future at one point. Fake food is the future where the thinking money will be made. Real food should be banned. So do the right thing. It doesn't matter who has another idea of what you should be doing. Ultra processed food, are 75% of the health problem. Get out of ultra processed food, whether it's lab made cellular meat or whatever it is, you know, turn to the earth and receive her gifts with love and knowledge and thrive on her gifts. And I can say personally, and I have no expertise in this in the way that you do, Vandana, but I, of all the things I've done personally that have affected my own mental well being and, and sort of health and happiness. You know, I thought it might be the meditation or the relationships, all of which are really important, but actually giving up ultra processed food, um, which I did some years ago, has been enormously transformative. So it's sort of this idea that food is medicine and nature is medicine in a way, which is so powerful. Now, um, one of the things that inspires me, but also gives me pause for thought is thinking about the next generation. I'm the father of three young children and Darcy's asked a question here. How do we engage with the youth to share these ideas especially when some of them feel there's no future or no hope for them? <laughs> Risking sounding like a broken record. Everyone should plant a garden. I said this to Greta, you know, when she came to me, when she met me. And I said, you know, a strike on the Fridays is very impactful. And you young people have done such a good job. But one, I was your age when I was involved in Chipko, but now I'm an old woman. And, uh, and your age is not static either. So prepare for a lifetime of this kind of work. And second, strike Fridays, the rest of the week is available to plant gardens, including begin in your school, school gardens, community gardens, church gardens. You know, I, I've advised a few universities and all, and I'd say, you know, this, this shouldn't be a cemented parking lot. And I've gone back 10 years later. And it is not a cemented parking lot. It has become a garden. So all these are possibilities. And it depends on where is the space for us to act. I don't think we should bang our head against the wall and say, oh, oh, oh I can't lobby government. Forget it. But you can lobby yourself, can't you? You can change yourself. And that's where you begin. And I don't think, you know, the idea of the mechanical idea was also an idea of not just separation from the earth and nature, but separation from ourselves. Who are we really? We are earth beings. We are interbeings. We are not just human. You know, like I said, the hundred trillion microbes in our gut. You know, our real identity is the microbes. Yeah. 
So humility, you know, rather than the arrogance that came with anthropocentrism, that not only are we superior to other beings, uh, not only are we separate from other beings and disconnected from them, but we are superior. That anthropic as arrogance must go because without other beings, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be alive. Without their well-being, we wouldn't be happy. And, uh, and so we should have the consciousness constantly of interbeings, both at the ecological level of the non-human species, but at the human level. I mean, our time is a time where society is being divided further and further and further through hate and fear. I mean, look at your government's decision to not allow those who are seeking refuge to enter. I mean, that is inhuman because, you know, welcoming guests and then finding humane arrangements for refugees has always been the role of every humane society. You know, when, when Bangladesh was created, hundreds of thousands of Bangladeshis were given shelter in India when His Holiness had to leave Tibet. 25 communities were given land in this country. And that's the way, that, that to me is the measure of being civilized, not conquest, not anger, not hate, not exclusion. Well said, and I, I, I feel that in a world where so much is being driven by a sort of fear of the other, you're reminding us that we are more interconnected than we realize and actually pursuing that common humanity, I hope is a solution to much of that division. I also love that Greta, um, example and the idea that you know you can be an activist uh, some of the time but you can also make little changes in your own life. To, I'm in danger of paraphrasing other people badly but I guess it's important to call for change but we can also be the change as well. Yeah. Mark I, I see growing the garden as activism too. Yeah okay. Because yeah. activism is not merely the resistance component. Gandhi differentiated between creative, constructive action, which is activism, because you act, and the resistance. But that too always coming from love and nonviolence. That's why Satyagraha, the power of truth, always working from truth and love to challenge brutality, to challenge injustice, and to challenge cruelty of every kind and violence of every kind. So, I, I, you know, I think we've stopped, we have to stop thinking activism only as those who go out on the streets and protest. People who are shifting the world's practices are activists too, they're constructive activists. Mm, well said, I love that. That's, that's really, I had not thought of it that way before, that's really helpful. Um, I'd like to move on to the theme of education briefly. We've had two questions that relate to education in different ways. First of all, Esther, Who's from, who designs educational programs for an NGO in Spain, um, sort of asks, what educational activities have you found to be most uh, sort of helpful for helping people feel a connection to nature? And, and related, Carlotta has said, how can we shift education beyond anthropocentric schooling and move from, well, as she says, from ego to eco, which I like. Um, yeah. What do you think about education and nature? Well, you know, I, I sent, a link to you, Mark, to send to everyone who's listening and everyone who will listen, that in a very organic way from saving seeds and growing a biodiversity farm, and it, a learning center grew, which we initially called the Beach with Yapit. And uh, part of it was, you know, Satish visited and said, oh, we must have a Shumang like institute here. Um, but Beach with Yapit was a bit heavy. Beach with Yapit means the school of the seed, where the seed is your teacher. So we now call it Earth University, where the Earth and nature are your teachers, but also those who work with the Earth are your teachers and practice being, you know, practical and participatory work is education. Um, and two people who really contributed to this in a big way for us in India was Gandhi, who created a system called Naitali. And he said, bookish learning to be clerks for the empire will not set us free. What will set us free is doing the right thing, learning vocations, you know, learning how to read and write. But if you are a pastoral community, learning about your sheep, learning about your cow, learning about your camel, 
if you're in weaving community, learning about weaving, not to give that up because that skill is where your freedom will come from. And most importantly, Tagore. Tagore who said, education in the West has come from brick and mortar and conquest. And our learning always came from the forest. We learned democracy and diversity from the forest. So he said, I'm going to create a forest university. And that's what the Shanti Niketan, his university, where I actually spent some time because my PhD guide was moving around, changing universities because he was, you know, he was so good, he was being asked to start a physics department here and a physics department there. But Tagore is the reason there's a Schumacher College, the Dartington Trust, you know? He basically said to Elmas, go and start something like Shanti Niketan in, in the West now. So Schumacher College and everything that Satish has done there. And please, you're so welcome to come to Earth University at any time, but there are particular courses that list has been sent to Mark and we look forward to your coming. Because well, it's, it's just, a learning of mutuality, with, it's a learning uh, of symbiosis, it's a learning of life. Uh, I'm just sharing that link that you sent me in the chat here. So we will send it around via email to everyone as a follow up. But if you're listening live right now, I've just popped the link that Vandana sent me into the chat so you can access that. Thank you so much for sharing that. We, we haven't got very long left together, but we've covered so much and this has been enormously helpful. Vandana, I wanted to ask you a more personal question. You've, you've shared some of this already, but could you share just some of the things in nature that bring you personally a real sense of joy and connection? What, what do you really, what uplifts your soul as you look around you in the natural world? Well, you know, as I said, I grew up in the forest and the forest gave me such joy and the disappearance of the forest gave me such pain that I became an activist. It's that pain that propelled me to act. But since I started to work in biodiversity and seed, you know, just the miracle of the little seed, knowing what it has to become. It doesn't need an external control to say a wheat grain must become a wheat plant. A rice variety of this kind will retain its distinctiveness to become a basmati and aromatic rice. Um, so the self-organized capacity of nature, the beauty of nature in her fullness and her self-organized evolution, the symbiosis, the coexistence, when plants grow together because the violence of the industrial agriculture is, chemicals require monoculture, so you never see coexistence. Every plant that wasn't sold by a corporation is treated as a weed to be wiped out by glyphosate. So the joy of self-organized systems that are organic, you know, not, not violently, designed in a pattern to serve extraction. Yeah? For me, beauty comes in diversity. Beauty is diversity. Beauty is not linear, imposed order. And even in human communities, you know, beauty is the diversity of cultures. Beauty is the diversity of languages. And uh, not everyone dressing in the same H&M and the same Levi's and everyone eating the same McDonald's. I mean, that makes me sad. That monoculture invasion is a loss, a cultural loss and an ecological loss to the world. Mm. Something in what you've just shared with that image reminded me of my dear grandmother who passed away many years ago, but she had a garden, this is in England, but she had a garden where she just let it run wild, not because she didn't care, but because she cared deeply. She knew the names of all the birds and all the plants and all and how it all connected and to others it looked like natural chaos rather than a beautifully manicured garden but to her it was just this beautiful source of diversity as you said and she cared for every plant of every type and every animal that was there and knew about it and it it had a quite profound impact on me at the time but I had forgotten about it until you shared that and actually I think that's something that we've let go of and lost. And Mark I think we've also misconstrued the idea of the wild because if you take the facts and the evidence, 80% of the biodiversity today is on 20% land, which is still with the indigenous people. What do the indigenous people have? They have care, knowledge, and love for the biodiversity. That's what has protected the biodiversity. So I repeatedly say, wild is not the absence of humans. It's a colonial construct. Wild is the presence of caring humans and the absence of colonizing humans. 
Well, I'm incredibly grateful to you, but also to all the other caring humans that are part of this community. <laughs> many hundreds here live together, many thousands more watching this, at whatever time works for you and wherever you are in the world. And I feel really um, grateful that we've managed to have this time together and a sense of connection to people all around the world in different countries and so much love and respect for you that I'm seeing in the chat and in all the questions, Vandana. We're so grateful for your time and for your wisdom and for all the work you've done. I wondered, as we as we end this time together, is there a sort of final closing thought you'd like to leave us all with? Well, one, happy Holi today of colours in India, lots of noise outside. Uh, happy Women's Day. And for the men who think Women's Day is only about women, it's about the caring qualities. Gandhi every day said a prayer, make me more womanly, make me compa more compassionate, make me more caring. And that quality, anyone can cultivate within themselves. It's about a quality. It's not about a sex. What a wonderful note to leave us with. And I try to embody that in my own life. And I really appreciate you sharing that and everything else you've shared today, Vandana. Please keep up your wonderful, life-changing, world-changing work. And we will try in our own way to plant our own little seeds and contribute to that vision you've laid out so beautifully. Thank you, everyone, for being here today. And thank you, particularly, Vandana, again, for your time. Thank you, Mark, and thank you all. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.